Anyway, so here we go. So in design school, we study great design in the hope of creating our own. If we're lucky, we had a single three hour long class on user experience, and the teacher probably called that human computer interaction. And after school, we take all of the very best work that we have done, and we put that in a beautiful online portfolio. The rest, all the bad projects that we didn't completely implement it, those that we did in a rush or during a single night, we put that in our archive folder in the hope that no one will ever find that again. And if you're like me, actually, I renamed that not archive, but I renamed that com something completely irrelevant to make sure that even when my boyfriend uses my computer, he wouldn't find that project. After school, all of the rest of the projects are easily forgotten and forgiven. No user will ever have to deal with the very bad design decisions that I made as a student. But by focusing and letting us erase all of our bad decisions, our teachers and mentors, they neglect to teach us something very important. What happens with that? What's the worst that could happen with the bad design decisions? As designers and developers, we have a lot of power on the way users interact and use our, with, well, our products and designs. And with great power comes great responsibility, to quote my very favorite uncle in Spider-Man. It's actually the uncle saying that. It's different from the movie, like, if you want to be precise. So what happened to bad design decisions? A lot of people think that bad design or bad product is an ugly product. I guess that's true in some way. But if we look at the top 50 website, e-commerce website, they share one thing in common, and it's ugliness. <laughs> They're all pretty ugly, we can agree on that. And as far as I know, no one dies from a website that is ugly. So you shouldn't be afraid of trying new stuff, innovating, even if you're not a designer, developing things and implementing things online with the fear that it might turn out ugly. Well, of course, it's better if something is beautiful, but it's not a big deal if it's not. There are way other, other ways that your design and decisions can affect people negatively. And one of them is by being hostile. And in order to explain what hostile design is, we have to talk a little bit about affordance. So if a shape could talk, it would tell you affordance. So for example, this is quite literal, this triangle would tell you that it's a triangle, and this rectangle would tell you that it's a rectangle. Pretty easy so far. But if you magically add a border <coughs> radius there, and a cool little drop shadow, all of a sudden, like that rectangle is begging you for you to press it. And when something is affordable, users, they don't need instructions. Video games are all about affordance. By a show of hands, who here has played Mario Bros? Good. Those that have never played, I'm sorry, that reference is going to be a bit alien. But <laughs> you should get where I'm going. Uh, so you just knew when you were playing, that you could jump on Koopa Troopa the turtle because it, has, it had a rounded back. It wouldn't kill you. It didn't need instructions, and I can tell that because I'm absolutely certain that all of everyone that raised their hand, no one has ever read the instructions before playing. <laughs> if you did, you would have learned some really, really interesting things. First of all, you would know that the mushroom is called Little, little Goomba. Who knew that, honestly? <laughs> and that little Goomba was a mushroom that betrayed the Mushroom Kingdom. No, and I quote, And Koopa Troopa the Green Turtle was actual, actually a soldier of the Turtle Empire. His orders are to find and destroy Mario. Jump on him and he stops moving for a while. So who knew Mario had such a big target on his back, seriously? And affordance is not only a digital concept that we see in video games, obviously. So the same way you knew that you shouldn't touch Spinny, see, I did my research, I know all the characters in Mario. So <laughs> you knew you couldn't touch Spinny, you know you shouldn't touch a hedgehog in real life. <coughs> that was my pet hedgehog, hedgehog, I could touch it. Or anything with spikes for that matter. And the hedgehogs, they don't come with instructions. I'm just gonna stop talking here, because there's a video, it's cute, people don't listen. Usually, it's not long. 
So the kitten here obviously doesn't like the hedgehog. And the kitten cannot read instructions. It just knows. The hedgehog carries a form factor with its spikes. Knowing that, would you sleep on that bench? So can I ask, why does that bench have spikes, if it's a bench? Or would you sleep on any of these benches, for that matter? I know that I wouldn't, but it's not a big problem for me because I have a very comfortable and warm bed that is waiting for me every night at my place except tonight at the hotel. These benches were created to restrict its access to a certain caste of society that might use them in a certain way that is not deemed normal. When a designer uses its knowledge of affordance in order to shape, interfere, or restrict the way a certain class of people can use its object, that is called hostile design. And these objects that control who gets to use them are quite bad. It's easy to say that it lacks empathy towards the users and needs. But let's be realistic here. It just mirrors a reflection of the role of a designer and developer. Production people, me as a designer, I'm commissioned by a client. And that client can be internal or external. And by definition, a client has business objectives that might not always be aligned with the user's best interest. In these cases, it is the role of the designer and developer to advocate for the user's best interests and user's need. So hostile design, sure, it means a lack of empathy, but it doesn't come from the designer or developer. <coughs> On the web, you don't have to read that. <laughs> On the web, hostile design exists, and it's referred to as dark patterns. It's a slightly darker version of hostile design. A dark pattern is when a user interfa interface is crafted in order to trick the user to do something that they wouldn't do normally, such as buying entrances or signing up for a recurring service without knowing it. Normally, when you think of bad design implementation, you think of a lousy designer, someone that is slightly lazy, maybe, that is not skilled enough, not enough experience. You don't think of designers as being hill intent intended but don't get me wrong, dark patterns are not mistakes. They're not made by bad designers. They're made by designers that really understand how people behave online. They're crafted with a solid understanding of users' behaviors. So just to give you an example, that here is from Royal Mail. This is hard for me to, to say. So Royal Mail wants you to register to their newsletter, quite obviously. So on the first row, it asks you, and if you don't follow me here, that's normal. I read it a couple of times, and it's quite long. Take the boxes relevant to your choice if you do not wish to receive any such communication. So you have to tick those that you do not wish to receive by post, telephone, email, or SMS. That's the first question. The second question, it asks you if you do want to receive them, tick it. So if you take every single one of them at the top row and you take every single one of them at the bottom row, you will receive all of the communications. This is pretty nasty. <laughs> this is what I call the trammel net. Trammel net is a way of fishing. It's like two rows of nets with big holes and small holes. And if the fish doesn't go through the first hole, it will get stuck in the second hole. That company, if it doesn't catch you on the first question, they surely will get you with the second question. Here's another example. You guys know the podcast reply hall. Yay. So um, one of the, the hosts of the podcast recently talked about his experience using Handy. And there's a company online where you can book uh, a, a cleaning service. They come to your place every week, two weeks, month, as you wish. They make it really easy to create accounts. Like, you can do that super easily, two, three questions, get a price, boom, done. But they make it impossible to cancel the service online. You just can't. Even if you were to look all over the internet, you can't cancel a subscription. People are not happy about that. You can imagine that when you're trying to cancel a service and you can, well, of course, it reduces the churn level. Hi. Say hello. OK. So it sure reduces the churn level. But after that, these people are really unhappy, and they start talking about it. 
These are just like a collection that I quickly got on Twitter. And if you look at the dates, these are all like 24 hour old, day, uh, well, when I prepared the presentation, they were 24 hour old tweets. And there were a bunch of them. I just selected a couple of them. <laughs> so why do company use these dark patterns? Why do they ask their designers and developers to integrate these things that we know are just evil? Well, that's because it works. It works in the short term. If you define your success by how many people subscribe to, their, to your newsletter, well, it's, you're going to be successful. And you even might receive a nice bonus for having su such great metrics and results. But the problem is you will pay for that, and a lot of money. Actually, LinkedIn just recently announced that it, would, like, that it lost a class action suit, and it will give back $13 million for sending those terrible email that it would send on your behalf that was one of the worst dark pattern ever. You guys know what I'm talking about when you would like, everyone's like nodding, like I sent an email to my uncle that is obviously not on LinkedIn and I don't even know how that happened. So if you're a designer or, dev, or, a, designer or a developer that is being asked to do one of these terrible things, speak up. You will save money in the long run and your company will like you for it. So uh, hustle design, it, makes, might uh, it might make people lose money, time, comfort, energy, but they're definitely not the worst that can happen with bad design decisions. So can design be worse than hostile and be actually cruel enough to cause pain? Obviously it can. And one of the ways it can do that is by using inadvertent cruel algorithms. Last December, Facebook launched a new app called Year in Review. To increase engagement, they automatically selected all of the top pictures from your feed. And to define what was the top picture, they just looked at the amount of likes. Obviously, it's every, if everyone liked your picture, it must have been nice. So they created a, a holiday-themed slideshow with these pictures. While they had generally really good intention in mind, they made the mistake of thinking that everyone had a great year that they actually wanted to be reminded of. For people that had experienced pain and loss, this served as a hurtful reminder of the year that they had passed. Here's what your year looked like. Has it showed balloons and streamers around a picture of a loved one that had passed away that year? Or around your house that burned down? Obviously, Facebook designers and engineers, they don't think they're doing badly, and I would probably have done the same. But let's not fool ourselves. They're not better than you and me, and we're not better than they are. They're just the same. It is our responsibility to ask, what's the worst that could happen with that feature that I'm creating and implementing? Let's not blame the project manager here. Everyone on that team could have seen that, could have thought of the, a picture in their feeds that was not that happy. They made another mistake. That leads me to the second point. Another way you can be cruel is by using symbols and emotions. <coughs> Do people use the like button always for really good reasons? I would argue that not at all. <laughs> so here's a reason why the like button is really good. I like bacon, and this bacon mask is surprisingly well crafted. <laughs> I'm going to like that. That's fine. It deserves a like. So here, Jane Doe announces that uh, she got the results of her x-rays, and she won't be able to walk this summer. I can guarantee you that this will get some likes. I've seen people announcing they were breaking up getting likes, a loved one that died getting likes. Like, it's terrible. I'm not stupid. I know that people that like this don't actually like this, like, <laughs> like you won't be walking. <laughs> Yay. No, I know. Like, it's just a way to say, like, I've read this. I support you. I, I have empathy. I have compassion and all of that. But when Jane Doe reads that she wants to be walking for that summer and sees that you've liked it, that doesn't make her feel any better. I don't think that she sees that as compassion. 
Recently, as you may know, Facebook announced a new feature called Reactions. It's meant as a way for people to express empathy beyond the like button, basically to avoid these other situations that we saw before. Zuckerberg actually said, and I quote, it's a way of sharing compassion when a thumbs up is socially inappropriate. Fair enough, I salute that. I actually think it's a really good idea and good job Facebook for making Facebook a more socially appropriate place. <laughs> but I'd like to express some concerns here. Oh. First, your brain no longer knows the difference between emoticons and emotions. I'm just going to repeat that. Your brain doesn't know the difference between a smiling face and a smiley face. Some researchers actually have shown, you see the top brain there? That's the occipital temporal section. That's also very hard to say. Um, <laughs> that's the region, that, the region that has the most activity when you see a smiley face. Second brain there, the region that has the most activity when you see a smiling face, which is basically very, very similar. And if you want to compare, they, show, they showed, I think it's a sale, I don't know how you call that actually. Any idea? Like, a helm? <laughs> so it's that icon, so just a random icon. Like, you totally see the difference between these, three, these two different cases. So why is that a problem? Well, let's just say it's a problem because your brain doesn't make a difference between a yellow thing and a face, but that's one part. But the other thing is that Facebook suggests a single type of happiness. By reducing every emotion to a simplistic emoji, we diminish the spectrum of reactions that we can feel. We remove the possibility of humor, sarcasm, Depth, compassion, even love. It renders empathy a mere click away. So let's see this situation here. A friend of yours announced that she finally feels better after a year in, uh, after a year, after a week of being sick. I'm guessing you're pretty happy, so you're like, yay. Expressing com um, uh, compassion here. I'd go for you, at least. Later, she announces that she just got the job that she always dreamt of. What do you do? <laughs> Yayer? <laughs> Can you make the smiley any bigger? You can't. That's fine. Like, that's not a big deal. Later that week, she announces that she's finally pregnant. That's the reason she was sick. You're actually generally super happy for your friends. So what do you do? You expose that smiley face. Uh, when you read happiness in a face, there are dozens of micro expressions that help. Well, there are dozens of micro expressions that help understanding the meaning of what you're expressing. When you're using words, you use techniques to reproduce that. You use synonyms, you use metaphors, example. All of this add nuances and context, helping you to express and define the way you react to something. But when your only option is a smiley face, what do you do? Do you really think that people will comment on it? Maybe they will. I guess we'll see how people will react with these new features, but my guess is that we will see more and more reaction and less and less comments. So talking of likes and symbols and icons, Facebook is clearly not the only one using these icons. My, this is a screenshot from my mail app on my computer. So in order to put something to my junk folder, see here a LinkedIn email? I have to dislike it. That's fair for LinkedIn because I actually do dislike it, so I don't really mind. Later that week, I received my, banking, my credit card banking statement, and it went in my junk folder. So I actually have to like my credit card banking statement in order for it to go in my inbox. 
you can guess that I do not like my, banking, my credit card banking statement, not at all. <laughs> Let's not mix something here. There's an emotion towards the content of that email, and there's an action that is literally just a change of state. It's a number in a database. Let's not use emotions to reflect a change of database. But it's just an icon, right? How important are these words and icons that we put on buttons? I would argue that they're very important. This is Airbnb. And not too long ago, a couple of years ago actually, they changed their star system. They had a star rating system to hearts. And the result of that was a staggering 30% increase in conversion. The star is just a regular favorite rating system, but the heart carries emotion. The heart shows that you might like something, you might dream of something. It's aspirational. So by just making that simple change, they saw that huge increase in number. So ask yourself, is the word or icon on that button really reflecting what the user experience is experiencing? Ask yourself, why am I in the dark right now? <laughs> Another way design can be cruel is by oversight. When the design, when the designers, when the developers forget a user scenario in the development of their app. A colleague of mine recently lived firsthand how design can be incredibly cruel. She was at work and she received a phone call during a lunch meeting. And it was her father announcing that her sister that had been battling cancer for a couple of years was in a critical state and they didn't know how long she had to go. So my friend lives in Ottawa, Canada. And her friend was in Toronto, uh, friend, her sister was in Toronto. That's 450 kilometers and that is 280 miles I've checked. So driving there takes up to five hours. She didn't know how long her sister had to, still could live. So while she was in the car, she received a phone call through FaceTime. Her sister called her to say goodbye. Her last words were delivered through FaceTime and this gives me goosebumps. It blows my mind. My friend actually said, I'm grateful that technology has evolved so that I was able to have those critical moments through this small device in my pocket. This is something that would have never been possible just a couple of years ago. However, while she was actually talking to her sister, her phone call got cut short. There was an error message saying, the name of her sister, is not available for FaceTime. I remember when Facebook launched FaceTime, well, when Apple launched FaceTime, sorry. <laughs> there was a commercial showing happy friends sending happy messages to other happy friends. There was sound here, but... on the most important phone call in your life. Was it a job interview over the phone? Your sister telling you that she's pregnant. 
asking your wife to marry you because you're deployed, learning that your friend is in a car accident. Now imagine knowingly saying goodbye to your sister and getting cut short by a message not available for FaceTime. What does that even mean? Is there a connection issue? You need, do you need to change any settings? You're in a car driving. You're stuck on your side of the screen with nothing else that you can do except blame yourself for not being able to understand that technology. I know that people working on FaceTime, they just didn't imagine that user scenario. But there are things they could have done to avoid that. And we're going to talk about that later. But when you get these messages, this is when you understand that this error message is designed. It's something that can be thought, planned, and changed. You can design for errors. You can design for death. You can design for all of these scenarios as long as you think of them. So design can be hostile. It can cause pain. It can be worse. It can be deadly. Design can kill, and not in a metaphorical way. <laughs> when you say, next time I see Comic Sans, I'll kill someone, or when God kills Kitten, or whoever is killing Kitten. I actually design can kill in a very serious way. In our office, there is a wiki page that outlines the emergency procedures in case of a fire. In that page, we learned that there are two types of alarms. It's very small. I'm just telling you through that. So two types of alarms. First one is you should get ready to leave, but don't leave yet. Might be a false alarm. Second one is get the fuck out. <laughs> so we're going to play a little game here. I'm going to play one of the two sounds. I'm not telling you which one. And by a show of hand, you have, to you have to tell me, should we leave right now? Or should we stay and continue working because it's yet another false alarm? Because they happen all the time. So I'm going to try to do this. Let me know if you hear. Show of hand, who rushes through the door? Oh, you died. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a terrible design. Someone thought we're going to make two different alarms that no one will ever hear at the same time to compare. And this is going to be the emergency one. That cute little like da, 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 da. Like. <laughs> so good thing there has never been a fire in the, in the office, but I made a point of telling everyone that if you hear an alarm that doesn't sound like an alarm, just run. <laughs> so here's another example. In 2007, I was backpacking across Central America as a young girl discovering the world, its beauties, and hidden secrets. I was traveling with my very good friend, Fred, in Guatemala. In order to see all of the hidden gems, we went to that hostel, that it's hotel, hostel, not sure, called Rio Dulce. And in order to get there, we had to take a boat ride of 15 minutes. The next morning, we have breakfast, and we eat cereals that contains, al that contains almonds. You probably have guessed right now that Fred is allergic to nuts, very allergic. Thankfully, he had his injector with him. He always traveled with it. I knew it. I knew where it was, so I run to get it. What I did not know is that once, once you start having an allergic reaction, you spasm. So his hands were stuck, and he couldn't open them. So he told me, Cynthia, you have to inject me. And the only thing I knew, and the only thing that I've been told, is like when you inject someone, you take a big orange, and you plug it in, and it all works magically. And I've always been told as well that I shouldn't do it on someone else. The person that is allergic should always inject themselves. So I gave him the injection, and it worked. But an injection works for 10 minutes, and we were 15 minutes away from the clinic. 
So 10 awfully long minutes later, we're on the boat getting to the hospital. And I know that I have to give him the second dose. <coughs> so this was not EpiPen that has a single dose. It was called Dulgec that had two doses. I tried to give him, and it didn't work. Imagine this. I'm on a boat that is rushing, going ridiculously fast. The water is bumpy. The ha my hair is actually like whipping my face. There are two tourists on that boat with us that are freaking out. The two are screaming and yelling. The boat driver is yelling at me in Spanish, things that I do not understand. And my friend asked one of the tourists to hold his hands while he's trying to breathe. I'm trying to stay calm and I resign myself to read instructions. This is not like in IKEA instructions. It should be easier to read. So I enrolled the instructions. And I read, slide the orange color of the plunger. I remember feeling really mad at myself for not being able to understand what that meant. Disclaimer, I studied plastic injection in industrial design in school. And I was baffled by the way that I just wouldn't understand what they were telling me to do. I panicked. And out of options, I started stabbing my friend with the syringe. 11 times, exactly. And the 11th time, the syringe broke and the plastic cracked open. And I can tell you very magically, I don't know how that happened, but it worked. I had just saved my friend's life out of pure panic. Let me tell you something. If I had wanted to save lives in my life, I would have chose a very different career path. I might have become a surgeon, a doctor, a nurse, a paramedic, not a designer. At least that's what I told myself before that day, before I saved my friend's life. Thankfully, Fred is fine right now. But it could have gone wrong because of a terrible, fucking terrible design decision. I know now because I went online on YouTube and looked for it. And it sounds stupid when you look at it that way. All I had to do is pop that little yellow thing. And maybe I couldn't find it because the instructions said that it was orange and it was actually yellow. Maybe because it was the step nine of instructions written really small on paper around a tube and I was on water, it was wet, and someone was screaming to me in Spanish and two girls were crying and my friend was dying. Maybe also because I just thought that that plastic part was part of the injector. So what do you do to save people's lives as designers, developers, content strategists, and UX researchers? First, let's write really clear instructions and error messages. Make sure you include every instruction, every possible troubleshooting information, and always include the next steps. Second, try to do testing with different emotional states. It's hard to test for panic. You're obviously not going to make panic for your <laughs> testers. That would be terrible. But we always test during usability testing. And we start by saying, take your time. Are you comfortable? Would you like some water? Don't worry. You cannot make a mistake. If you make a mistake, it's my mistake. It's not yours. We go above and beyond to make the tester feel super comfortable to avoid the lab effect. Would we get valuable and very different 
insights if we were to tell the tester, no rush, but you have five minutes to complete that task? <laughs> I think so. Why not do it? You'd save money. <laughs> Third, let's ask ourselves, what's the worst that could happen with what I'm doing, building, implementing right now? Here's a table. For those that can't see it, it goes from few of the people, some of the people, most of the people, all of the people. And the other axis says very little of the time to all of the time. And this is generally how we create and prioritize different features when we build a new software, website, whatever. Whatever is used most of the time is prioritized. What is, whatever is used few of the time by few of the people is deprioritized. Now, if you gather your team and you brainstorm and ask yourself, wait, could someone die from this? And the answer is that it could hurt a single user well, maybe you should reprioritize your backlog. It is okay to be annoying to 100% of your users if it's in order to save a single life. Users feeling emotions and lives should always triumph a deadline, a budget, and a feature. For example, here's Tumblr asking a person for search, a person that is search, ugh a person that is searching for sadness or sad, it's telling it, would you like some help? This is a very good example. It might be useless to most people, but if it saved a single life, I'm willing to give money to that content strategist there. Fourth, can we stop saying users? Let's start, let's start saying people. People, they don't submit forms. They apply for jobs. They don't click the like button. They're generally happy because of that bacon mask. <laughs> Finally, people, they don't convert. <laughs> That's my favorite. They don't convert. They purchase gifts. They purchase auto parts, food for their cats. They do all of that online. They're not converting when they're doing that. And in order to design for the people, well, just become the people. Research, ask questions, use your own product. You will never regret from having too much information on the way people behave online. Observing people, testing, surveys, Everyone is responsible for that, not only UX researchers, and that is if you're lucky enough to have one. Humans are very complex beings. They're able to feel a multitude of emotions. Designing for empathy, they say. That's very trendy, but what does that even mean? What emotions are we really designing for? As designers, developers, product creators, we choose selectively what emotion we're designing for, and we ignore the rest. Any engineers here? Engineers, they have a ritual in Canada and in the States, if I'm not mistaken, where they receive a ring at graduation. You know the story behind that ring? So in the 1900s, during the construction of the Quebec Bridge, the bridge collapsed, killing 75 people. Most of them were workers. The collapse was due to an error of judgment from the engineer that designed that bridge. The myth says that the first rings were actually made from the iron of that bridge. It was, a, it was just a way to symbolize humility and a reminder to your responsibility to the public. 
Here's my question to you. What is your ring? What will you do? What will you find? What will you carry around with you every day in order to remind yourself that you might kill someone one day? Thank you. <laughs>